Well, let's go ahead with, in, in the essence of time, go ahead and get started. We can uh, take a look and dive into the book that we are reading. So at this iteration of the uh, User Defenders Community Book Club, we are looking at Don't Make Me Think by Stephen Krug. And so usually this is where I hold up the book and, and you know, say what it is that we're talking about. But actually, this is like the first book that we've done that I've done virtually. And so that kind of gave it a new, uh, a new spin uh, when it comes yeah, down to the usability and me doing things on uh, the Kindle, because I had that whole lens while um, I was doing the whole time about different links. And then also, too, there were a lot of different descriptions, which I liked as well, and we can get into. But um, yeah, so with, with all the book clubs, you know, some folks have read the book. Some folks have only read a little bit. Some folks have finished it all. So this is just kind of, the book is kind of just a jumping off point for us to talk about some of the different topics uh, that really were brought up in the book. And I think really the big one um, that's pretty glaring is just is usability and making products that are usable for our users and things along those lines. So um, with that, why don't we go ahead and just hop in when it comes to usability or the book in of itself, what are some of the things that, the, that were key takeaways for folks um, while reading? Uh, I can start, I can say generally, if just the term. Um, so that's one of the things that I find being kind of later in my career when I reread these or read them from a different lens. Um, it was nice. So I read the revisited version and mm -hmm. him just talking through like it used to be user centered design and then it was UX. And I think usability has always been there, but I think it's getting redefined or probably like more zeroed in because mm -hmm. from everything that we've learned in the past few years, there was a, a there were times where design, I guess you could say was taking over, but usability had been put on the wayside. And I think it depends on your job that you have to do and the company that you are doing it for. Um, so I thought that that was really impactful for me just as like a leader and trying to influence businesses of focusing more on that usability piece of our work. Um, and not just like, I guess if I use a bad comparison, like the UI, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that it, it, it was a reminder for me to to lean into that further um, than just, not just like the basics, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Well, I think you bring up a good point because that was something that I saw as well in the revisited this aspect of like um, now kind of you, instead of it being like one field, um, it's the kind of UX it's kind of splinters off and people kind of have to think that they have these different focuses and distinctions. So what do you see in that? Do you see that usability is still there and sprinkled throughout or do you, see it kind of as the opposite of where kind of people think you may be usability is not my wheelhouse, not my lane. And so don't really kind of think of it. What is it? How do you think usability as kind of more things have gotten more refined and through that more separated, the usability kind of plays out now? I think that that's the P that's part of it is just um, being, I could see where it could get separated and people could like be like, Oh, well, the design is fine. Right. Um, or they can, consider usability or responsibility for another team, whether it be like the research team or um, even the analytics team, like validating some of the things that get shipped. So um, for me, it was kind of a responsibility to make sure it's being bled into the work of all of the UX work. Um, because you can get into, if you're in a bigger org or um, if your responsibility and your scope is smaller, you can get into a space where it's also not necessarily your job to make sure that the usability is like completely flushed out. Um, so that was more of like it, what I, what stood out to me. Cause I think it happens where the usability piece gets lost. Yeah, I agree. I feel like I've read this book. I read it a long time ago and I actually have one of the original ones from like 2000 and the spine is like fall has fallen apart so uh that i read through it and it was a long time ago and then i and then i got the digital version the updated version and i'll be honest i kind of skimmed through it i didn't read every single word but i, I skimmed through it and 
I, I think for me, like still, even with the revised edition, which was still, which was several years ago, right? That mm -hmm. he updated this. Mm -hmm. uh, so even, even now it's still, it still feels a little bit dated. Some of the examples of course are feel a little dated, uh, but the principles are still true. And, and I think he even opened it up as introduction that way. Like this is why mm -hmm. I wrote the, uh, you know, right, the updated version. Yes, some of the examples are probably going to be dated by the time you read this, but you know that the reality is for me, uh, this this book is full of common sense, mm. and it, it is it's it's full of common sense. And then the uh, the you know the piggyback to that statement is common sense is not very common, right? Sure. So I, I feel this is still a really important book, and uh, I I still feel like the principles, especially the psychology behind human computer interaction are still resonant today. And the fact is, is that, uh, and I love how he really exposes this truth. The fact is we design things in a way that's completely different than how our users are gonna actually consume them. And so like we, we look at every single detail and, and rightfully so we should, but the reality is when it comes down to it, we really need to, our users are really just looking to accomplish something as quickly as possible and with as little friction as possible. So I, I just, I feel like there's timeless truths to, to this book still. And so I, I appreciate that for that reason. Kind of brings up that point. There's a lot of humility that goes into being an experienced designer. You really have to put yourself in their shoes and it's not about you. Cause that's, that's a big thing I took about that yes. too. I really, I like this book because it gave me a lens to kind of view through the way that I interact with things, especially things like websites of, you know, what is it I'm looking to do? How quickly do I do it? And then also, you know, in what setting am I doing that? Is that on my phone? Is that on my iPad? Um, different things along those lines. And so um, I'm kind of like you in the aspect of where realizing that, you know, it's common sense. Actually, when I first started reading this book a couple of years ago, um, I'd never finish it. I put it down because I was just like, this is just, you know, straightforward kind of types of stuff. But and then you start thinking about it and it, it's not as straightforward. And then you start designing things and the art starts going into, you know, overcoming the usability where it might be mm -hmm. beautiful, but it's not functional. And so, you know, the importance of that uh, as well. So yeah, right there, right there with you in that. And I, I think that that's where it's nice that it is that common sense because it really allows kind of that opportunity to be reflective and kind of to really think about things. And I think what's neat about this book as opposed to other, some of the other ones that we've read is it really is practical information. We've read a lot of books where it's more of kind of philosophical about design and mm -hmm. uh, what's owed, what the designer owes the user and, and that kind of stuff. But this was pretty much straightforward. It's like site ID, top left, maybe the middle. If it's, you know, if it's uh, an English left to right uh, type of language and just like really things to be able to look at and to really put into place practically right off the bat. Absolutely. I wish I could have given this book out to many, many, <laughs> many stakeholders in yeah. my career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this would have been perfect, uh, especially the last one I worked for, who, for whatever reason, he had everything figured out. And <laughs> when I skimmed through the book last night, I looked and I went, and it brought back a lot of memories on mm -hmm. how resistant people can be and how everything in this book, and I was also talking about this on a, on a, a meetup chat yesterday as well. Uh, Marcy Sutton brought it up and uh, Jason, you touched on this where the, the psychology and the stuff is timeless. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, some of the examples are outdated. Um, I mean, I don't have, I had the, I had the second edition, the white covered one. Um, I guess that's different from revisited. Looks like I'm gonna have to get a new, new book. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, a lot of stuff and just uh, skimming through it and just saying, you know what? I wish I could have said this mm -hmm. at, at this point, and I wish, could have, but you know, it's a, it's all a learning process. So it's a great book. I love it. Yeah. What were some of the chapters that you might have pointed folks to when you gave it to them? What might you dog eared or 
put a little post-it note in when you gave it to him. Uh, probably every page, but <laughs> we narrow, if we want to narrow it down, uh -huh. um, the main ones are uh, chapter five, where it's omitting needless words. That's one yeah. of them. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of, I've found in my work, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of content that didn't need to be there. Uh -huh. uh, or it could have been elsewhere. Um, street signs and breadcrumbs on chapter six. That's another yeah. good one. Um, I remember many a time where they had to cram everything into that top navigation. Mm -hmm. And the site was 50, 100 pages. And it was like, no, you don't, <laughs> you don't need, and it was, you know, it would be at times repetitive. Um, and again, needless words that are in, you know, that are combined into, you know, your navigation, um, which this is a great book too, to accompany um, another book I read, Jerry McGovern's Top Tasks. Um, mm. Top Tasks is a great book that breaks down, you know, what are your top tasks? What are the most important ones down to the lowest ones? This book, um, you know, just solidifies that. And what there's, there's one, there was, yeah, there's one more. Um, usability, chapter 10, usability as a common courtesy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's one I would dog ear and give to everybody <laughs> as a Christmas card. <laughs> Put a lobster yeah. behind it, right? Of course. <laughs> of course. That's awesome. I think that's um, like what you were saying, Ross, about this book in particular than the ones that we read before is easy to like pick up and use. It's very tactful in that way. And then when I listen to Todd, it just reminds me that um, it's a good tool when you are doing your work. So for instance, not everyone in the company is a UX expert or you, you know, design expert. And to us, it's common sense, but to everybody else, we're constantly having these conversations like the breadcrumb um, or making things practical. And so it's a good way for you to communicate what you need to because we're going to be having the same conversation almost every single time. If, from what I'm hearing, like yeah. a lot of this, and from what Todd was saying, like every time, every job, every stakeholder, mm -hmm. and how long have we been doing this, right? So I liked, um, I think the only really the revisited one, which was helpful for me, um, was the mobile piece. Mm -hmm. So you're even in everything that we tackle, um, there will be, we'll, even though it's common sense, you still need examples for the newer thing, right? So does this apply to also mobile and how do you prove that or like who's talking about it? What can you reference? And then it's gonna be voice. So I'm glad that um, he said it, just like Jason was saying in the very beginning, it was like, I didn't do a revisited one because it's common sense. And if the page image that I used is outdated, it's outdated, but this, the words are the same. Um, but I'm glad that he added mobile because this is even, it's very, very difficult to argue common sense when it comes to work, when you're dealing with stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Like with you guys, if I was just like, clearly this doesn't look like a button, you'll be like, oh yeah, I get it. Um, where everyone else is just like, they're so tunnel vision that they can't see the common sense. And I struggle with the proper way to eloquently like explain it. You know, like it, that's where you get to some people being th like things like in our own environment, you just can't talk to people that don't get it. Like there's no, there's no words, there's nothing you could say. Um, but in the work that we do, we don't have that luxury. And so it's nice to have something tangible to reference. Even if I were, if I were to mentor or coach younger designers on how to, um, 
sell their work through or explain what they're doing, I would be able to give them something like this, right? So there, that's part of it. It's like, there's only a few things I think for us that we can point to and say like, oh, if I quote this, right. <laughs> I didn't make this up. <laughs> You know, I'm not just saying it, even though it's so easy, you know, there is somebody that also um, wrote this. So I, I really like that, that I can just pick this up and use it in any, you know, conversation. Oh, sure. And I think that kind of that point, one of the things I noticed in this book that um, was kind of resonant of what the last book we read of Lean UX of just the different ways mm -hmm. that we can break down the, the buy-in and the, the barrier for entry just to get as many people on board in some capacity. So, you know, um, there is a, a lot about the um, how it is that you do testing and just getting mm -hmm. people and I think it was mentioned like four or five times of just like getting a nice lunch and that'll draw people in but I think that, that speaks to what you're talking about in addition to being able to point them to something that's common sense and easy in the book is you know finding those ways that can easily get people just wrapped in because I mean you know we mm -hmm. might be a little biased because you know we love design or whatnot but I think pretty much everyone loves design they loves the aspect of finding more meaning in things and making things better whether that's you know services or experiences or or people and whatnot so i think it's one of those things of just getting people in the door you know the the design mantra of just wanting to make things better kind of gets people off and running so that was something that i kind of thought of as well as another way to get people into the mix is just getting them to see it and um, that'll kind of start them talking the language and whatnot so that seems like one of the easy ways too and the uh, easy points of entry is pointing to something as practical as this and little things to do really right away. Definitely. I, I always say that being a great designer begins and ends with being a great human. And I really believe that because and he really sheds, uh, he illuminates that point throughout his, this entire book. It's really like his, I think if, if you could sum it up in like a sentence, it's like, um, as a designer, be a good human and help the people that are using your experience. Help them. Like he uses the example of like lighting in a store. If you're mm -hmm. trying to sell something and you have poor lighting, like why do you think the jewelry stores, for example, invest so much time and so much money in the perfect lighting to shine, uh, per, the, to illuminate the jewels they're trying to sell you for you know, exponential amounts of money? Those that lighting is just as critical as the uh, the actual gym, the actual jewelry, right? Okay. So I think that's kind of the the idea here as designers, like we need to, and, and again, it always goes back to empathy, right? Like we need to put ourselves in our users' shoes all the time because the moment we stop doing that is the moment that uh, that we uh, are not that we. Uh, introduce a lot of obstacles in, in the way of their goals. Mm -hmm. And we're not being good humans. We're not practicing empathy. So really, I think this is all, it, it all tells that story, I think. You know, just be a good human, be a good designer, be a good human. And I think that's, you know, a point that he really draws on and, you know, the, as the chapter of goodwill, design is goodwill or usability is goodwill. Just, it's the right thing to do, like baseline. That's yeah. the thing you should do. But also too, I actually don't think that he, he hit hard enough on the aspect of like how good it is in a business sense. And I wonder if that's because it's revised and, you know, now we have just so many different options, but I was, as he was writing that, I was thinking there have been times where I have not bought a product and I've just not gone back to a company, just not felt trusted just by the way that the website felt and looked, mm -hmm. um, it's, especially yeah. nowadays so much, we put so much trust in the entire package and that being the website. And so I think that he actually said something along the lines of, you know, if, if the website doesn't look good, no one's going to, you know, not buy or, you know, not come back or whatnot. I think that that's changed, at least, you know, in my own personal opinion, there have been certain times, certainly times where I've just not felt comfortable giving my money to this. And there's so many different other options out there that it has come to a point where, yes, it's the right thing to do. That should be number one, but also just business sense of people will, will, you know, will stop, will cease, will go somewhere else if they're not enjoying the experience that they have in the moment. Exactly. Yep. And that ties in a lot. I've been more on, and Jason knows this, I've been more on the accessibility side of things as of late, mm -hmm. which there is a really very, I mean, they're tight knit, they're, they're closely correlated together. 
So yeah, empathy and, you know, the fact that if it's not accessible or it doesn't look good, you're going to lose people. Mm -hmm. Um, I won't necessarily put off a brand forever because their website's horrible. But if I'm there for an hour trying to order two things, yeah, sure, that might <laughs> that that might come into play a little bit. But uh-huh. um, I mean, yeah, a lot of empathy for the. the as someone put it to me a while ago, the other, the people on the other side of the glass matter most. Mm. Yep. Yep, sure. Yes. Well, for me, it's kind of a canary in the coal mine situation. I, I give the uh, allusion to whenever I go to a sushi restaurant, a new sushi restaurant, I'll always go to the bathroom and to see what that's like. Because if they're not keeping up keeping the bathroom, if there's other things that are just like, like one time a sushi restaurant didn't have any forks. I'd gone one time and the next time they didn't have any forks and it was like they were using plastic forks. And I was just thinking, what's the breakdown here? What's happening behind the scenes that you didn't plan to like have enough forks for everyone? And so it's that aspect of, of if this isn't being taken care of, what else isn't being taken care of? And so that's kind of, I think why it is that I, uh, abandon different things or just don't feel trusted, especially if it's a large purpose, because it just, you know, it's an indicator for me more than anything else. It's not just that it's not a bad experience, that it's a bad experience or I'm not, you know, feeling it. It's just what, what more deeply does this tie into? What other systemic issues might be going to play here? Yeah, that's like never trust a skinny chef. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's good. Yeah, it's the I think that's a big. We're, we're back to psychology. Yeah, it's a, that's the big challenge about being a designer in a company you don't own. Um, mm-hmm. You possibly weren't there when the original design happened. Yeah. Um, and you're also not the end all be all stakeholder, which is super difficult, right? So then I always have to put all of this stuff that I learn onto my team or my, my stakeholders and overemphasize and figure out how we got here, right? So why does the site look like the way it does? Why did we never put effort in this part of the site? Why do we think it's fine to just have a, this site up and not have a fluid experience? Um, and how did we get there? And a lot of the times I find that when stakeholders are judging or accepting design work, they're designing for themselves. And then we have this whole like, you know, you're not a consumer. Well, they are, but they may not be the consumer of the business that they're representing, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a big piece in my last company. We sold um, plus size apparel and like true plus size. It was like 14 to 44. And just having this conversation about like, are you shopping our sites? Like how often do you see your site? And I find that a lot too um, with designers and corporations where um, your stakeholders don't even really look at your own site. You know, it's, if you are a corporation where you have a store and, and a website and, you know, all these things, um, they may never even go to .com. So it's like having to put your emphasis or your empathy and your all those tools on the stakeholder to unpack <laughs> the mess that we're in to mm-hmm. sell through, you know, why you need to even more so be an advocate for the user. Um, I had a funny situation happen. We had an opportunity to redesign like cart and checkout and uh, we were very promo heavy type company, coupons all the time, but God forbid it be a coupon you can understand. Like just the <laughs> sheer like alien language of this coupon and then nothing's copy paste right everything's like bled into the image Mm -hmm. so many like usability breaks but um i was like great okay so if we looked at this template in the mindset of what's the primary thing the person's trying to do which is figure out how much i'm gonna be spending by putting in my promo code we put the promo code first you'd be surprised like the conversations that we're having like oh my god if we make the promo code field easier to get to, then they'll use it more. <laughs> and I was like, but so we never had this conversation before, I guess, right? As a business. Uh-huh. Um, so things like that, uh, where I find that I, I have to first start with using all my usability and UX skills mm-hmm. to my stakeholders, 
just to have a conversation of like, okay, how much of an advocate do I really need to be? Like how far apart are these stakeholders from their actual consumers and that, that persona that we put together? I like what you said, Tiffany, because that reminds me of a an app I was working on for the UI and I had moved some things, but really kept the design the same. And there was a little bit less white space, but the VP, he loves his acres and acres of white space. And he's like, well, you know, the white space is great. I love it. I love everything pushed off to the left of the screen. <clears throat> so I said, okay, we had a couple people uh, new customers that we were um, going to run through the system. And when we did, all you could see on our, it was a WebEx call that we used, was the mouse cursor doing one of these Oregon Trail type deals in just five minutes of this. And just, it's just, it was, it was cringeworthy. And, you know, it, 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 kind of reminded me, I have to bring up the background. It kind of reminded me of this. Where is it? <laughs> everything's fine. <laughs> you know, everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. where the disconnect, you know. Mm -hmm. So what you were talking about really kind of brought that back for me. That was like good to remember as well. And how did that play out? Did they see the five minutes of just kind of going wherever and then back off on their white space or were they just still oblivious to that? The, the deer in the headlights look like that dog in the background. No, that was, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, um, it was a very, there was a lot of pushback mm -hmm. because there was no understanding of not only, you know, the guy is a financial guy. Uh, there's no understanding of design. There's no understanding of development. Um, so those kind of people I've learned, you have to educate and kind of move along at a decent pace, whether it's UX accessibility, you know, whatever, whatnot. Um, and as much as I tried to, the resistance was just, mm -hmm. there was a lot of resistance, a lot of pushback. Um, but I was also given some good advice when they push back, push back a little harder, and maybe you'll get somewhere, maybe you'll meet in mm -hmm. some middle ground. And I did that with the usability. I said, well, you just saw a cursor move around a screen for five minutes when they couldn't find a particular, every, everything was a link too. There were no buttons. There needed to be a lot of, there needed to be some buttons and there was no buttons. <laughs> so there was a lot of links and for whatever reason, they just didn't, they didn't want to proceed, you know, with modernizing anything, so. Uh, Todd, that's a great illustration that you threw up there. I, I appreciate the visual. <laughs> Because it's a, it was like timely and it really painted the picture of what you were sharing. And it also kind of sparked some, some thinking around what we do, what, and I say we as a, at large, and a lot mm -hmm. of times we as designers are forced, uh, Tiffany, as you said, to make something that doesn't make sense, that yes. is not common sense because the higher ups were being paid by the people who are, you know, the hippos, the highest paid people in the organization that are saying, I know, like they may not even admit that it doesn't make sense, but they'd be like, I want it this way. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of struggle that we as advocates, as uh, the mediators between the business and the user, we, we encounter. And so that illustration, Todd, it really made me, it, it sparked a thought in my head that for, for, for one, actually two thoughts. One, uh, I and many others may sit in that fire for a few minutes if that was cat poop coffee in that, in that cup there. <laughs> 
I, I may sit in that fire for a few moments to enjoy that, uh, you know, $50 a cup coffee. But um, it, it also, that made me also think about that's what we do. That's what designers and what organizations, let's say, do to a lot of their users. They say, oh, the reward will be worth it, right? Like you can suffer through this, you, this horrible UI. You can suffer through this terrible UX. Uh, but trust me, the reward is worth it if you get to, to that. And, and, and how often do we all do this as users? We're users. Designers are users, too. Um, and I think that's what makes us good designers is when we use a lot of products and we find problems and we learn from other people's mistakes, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we do that. We, and, and, and oftentimes there's the assumption, oh, they'll suffer through it to get to it. Like Spotify for me, for many years, Spotify <laughs> was that way. <laughs> they have a new I, design I, team. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm a, what do you say, a glutton for punishment. Mm -hmm. Because I've been, I've been paying them for over a decade to torture me with a terrible UI mm. because of the content. I suffer through it because of the content. And I've, and I've invested the, the psychology behind investment. I've invested many hours developing my playlist. I can't leave. There's nothing else that I can use. I'm stuck, right? <laughs> so, but I think that's what we do. And that's what a lot of businesses will do. And, and a lot of, uh, you know, um, you know, CEOs and uh, you know, higher ups, they're getting the, you know, the nice fat paychecks and they're like, oh, everything's fine. You know, we still have our user base. There's no, nowhere else they can go. Mm -hmm. Right. We have the market on this. Oh, you do for now. You do for now. But guess what? We live in a very disruptive technological mm -hmm. age where I promise you, if not uh, in, in a week, if not in a month, if not in a year, somebody's working on something better that mm -hmm. is going to sideswipe you. Mm -hmm. and, and the people that are suffering through your UI and your UX right now to get to your content, they're going to immediately leave. They're not loyal to you. Mm -hmm. They will defect. And I've seen it happen. I worked at MySpace in 2007 to 2009. <laughs> yeah. Facebook did yeah. that to us. That's exactly yeah. what happened. Um, so there's a lot of lessons here. Uh, yes, you may have the market for now, but if you don't iterate or die, and if you don't consider your users and have empathy for them and continually to Im and continually improve and measure and improve, you will lose that. What you have now will be gone. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. That's yeah. I, think, I think about that even as like a more recent example. So I love the term proprietary eponyms. Those are basically like words that are, um, are corporate brand names, but people use for everything. So like Band-Aid is technically, you know, is an adhesive bandage or Kleenex is a, a tissue. And so right. I feel like that's gone to happen now with Zoom. I used to use Skype all the time and use like, oh, you know, we'll Skype. And I use that word for video messaging. I was watching TV the other day and um, someone, you know, was embarrassed. They, they come out in their underwear and they realize there are people there and they thought, oh, <laughs> I thought that this was a Zoom. And so I, I picked it up, I'm like, so that's the, the proprietary impotence changed. Like now mm -hmm. Zoom, they're doing all kinds of stuff. And I've, I've seen them revamping things really quickly in this time that we're in with everybody on. And, you know, we're Zoom, using Zoom right now. Um, but yeah, um, Jason, as you were talking, it made me think a lot of one of the books we read previously, The Ruined by Design, and how much in that was just um, really it's up to the designer to really stick to your guns and to stay confident. And, and if you're designing things that, you shouldn't be designing, you know, rethink that $50 cup of coffee or, you know, what is it that you need to do? Make some serious, some serious questions. And so I think that that goes in with what Todd was just saying too, because I was thinking, you know, well, as you're talking with someone and trying to, to enlighten them, you know, what's step number one? And you were saying that aspect of pushback. And I think that that's it. It's just being confident in what it doing, knowing that what you're doing and designing is right, sticking to those guns and staying with it. And then, if it still doesn't work, I think that then, you know, ruined by design becomes a little bit more salient at that point. Start thinking and asking some of those big questions. But um, all that just to say, I wanted to, to piggyback off on all the things that y'all were saying, because um, they were really kind of resonating in those, those points I brought up. Yeah, I was lucky to have a very passionate uh, VP of product that I reported into. Yeah. And he was the type of person, like the core of him as a person was if it wasn't smart, then like he would be really angry about why we're doing it, which is very difficult in a corporate setting. And so um, in that, similar to like what Todd did, we, it's the framing, right? So I found all these pain points 
glossed them up as like a whole report about like pain points that our customers are going through. We're company, as a company, we are in a space where we possibly are like death by a thousand paper cuts, right? So it's okay, well, where is the leaks happening? And I think that if we think about some of the things in this book, no one company only has one of these problems. They're probably failing in a couple of these, right? And how that adds up. And so the, someone needs to design this because this is very difficult. So we started taking video snippets of um, the session recordings that we were seeing, like that whole, you know, the cursor going for five minutes. And my VP was like, put it in the report, make these like stakeholders are, you know, sea level actually watch these videos. Cause when you watch the video, then you're like, want to tear your hair out. <laughs> and we had themed in like different pieces and then I had like links. And so the report is just ridiculous it's too full and it's linking to YouTube and just all this stuff. Um, but it was super impactful. And I found like that silver lining where clearly I'm not in the luxury to not have a job. So it's not like, oh, you're going to make me design something dumb. I'm going to leave. Like, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for the rest of my team either. But I found like um, comfort in being the one person to bring it to the table and be like, look, this is really crappy. These are the reasons why it's crappy. This is the effort it would take to fix it. And is, if as a business, we are all going to like hold hands and say like, yeah, we know we're just going to let it be crappy. Then, then I feel like, okay, I've done enough. Like I told you that this is dumb, <laughs> like in a very professional sound way. And mm -hmm. now that you have the opportunity to actually decide if you decide that this is how you want it to be, then, you know, I've done my job. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really kind of in a transitional space like what I started to kind of get lean into and have the team be really um, more focused on so that we were in a sense still being true as designers or as a design team and just being in a space where we didn't really have full control, you know, but we did everything we could to say as a, as a principal and as an expert, I'm telling you this is wrong yeah. and this is how it should be. And then you either you take it or leave it, but not, not not saying it right mm -hmm. and testing into it right because you're you mm -hmm. are an expert and you and you can be confident and stand in that confidence of like this is why you hired me right and then it's like right but don't just take my word for it <laughs> look at these people that are paying for your product and services right. look at them suffer watch right. them suffer <laughs> you know get those videos together and and edit them into a nice tight you know five minute you know, uh, expose about like, just watch them suffer, like right. build that empathy, right? And also not just pull, like pulling up the mirror and being like, look at all the things that are wrong, but also being like, and this yeah, is the solution. Yeah. Like I'm giving you the solution. Yes. Do we want yeah. to make this investment? Like, you know, so that's, that's yeah. where I really find a lot of like grace to be able to be able to you know, fully own that conversation and then leave it up to someone else to say no in that regard. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It, it doesn't, it doesn't pay any longer to, I guess, finger wag or berate mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, shame on you. Uh, and I don't have a game of Thrones background, but the shame, <laughs> the shame, the shame, um, <laughs> uh, it, which is, you know, uh, it's bringing me back to the accessibility space where, you know, you see a, uh, something that's inaccessible or you see something that, not, that the user experience is not very good and you, you don't want to say, well, you know, this is wrong and this is what you need to change and why you should change it. It's taking that, that stakeholder or it's taking whoever and saying, this is how we can fix this to make it better for the user. Yes, you're right. It's about the framing, right? And, yeah. and I've had conversations like this. I've worked on products that were created by developers and there were no designers involved in the process. And you can tell, you can tell that there, <laughs> there was like, yeah. yes, <laughs> I mean, you let's can. be honest. Know that there was a, la a bit of a, a lack of just uh, of awareness. That's all. It's it's not that they weren't trying 
to do to hurt hurt the user or hurt the experience. They just didn't know better. And so um, uh, all that to say, it, I've never made any progress by going and having conversations with these folks and saying, this sucks. Like <laughs> you really screwed up here. Like this is that makes zero sense to any you know human with any you know uh, working knowledge of, of how to use a computer. Like this has no there's no business with it. You never get anywhere. You say, and you say you know this. You point out the good stuff. Like like this is pretty awesome. Like and, and genuinely like some of the stuff that they did. I was like, wow, this is really impressive for a product uh, built and designed by developers. Uh, and then you say, what if, you know, how, here's how we can make it better. And, and I, I would refrain from using a fix. I would refrain from mm. you saying, Let, this is how I would fix this. Because it immediately, it, it, it reflects to them like, oh, this is, there's something wrong. It's, it's broken or it's bad, right? So it's a, it's a personal reflection on them. But it's like, hey, this is great. But let's make it, let's see how we can make this better. Improvements. Improvements. And, and it should probably be the framing of that. That's a great point, Todd. Oh, totally agree on that. And the yeah, the word the wording does help. The wording does help um, because I've worked with developers that you know it's the age old lots of divs for a button and say why don't we <laughs> divide this? Why don't we yeah? Why don't we improve on this by making this just a button element and going forward from there? And that will help performance and that will help accessibility and that will help you the user experience as well so yeah yes same way with stakeholders same way with executives this is their baby right like you may have just been you may have just been brought in you've only been there for several months these folks have been working on this for years probably this is this is personal it's not just business this is very personal so it's it's the same way when you're talking to stakeholders same way when you're talking to executives they they have some part in this so Absolutely. Yeah, and that and the app that I worked on at the last job was a 15-year-old code base. Mm -hmm. And I said, why don't we improve upon what you have here? Because it was a very niche market. And why don't we why don't we modernize it? Because as someone who had to deal with customers while I was there, I would have to tell them you can only look at it on Internet Explorer 11 in compatibility mode. And that, a little piece of me went with that phrase every single time. <laughs> a little piece of you died? Yeah, a, a little bit, very little. <laughs> Nothing the lobster roll can fix though. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, it, it, it's just, dipl diplomacy. I guess you could yes. say is is a good oh, word. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think also, um, oh God, if I think about uh, when you have an opportunity to come in, you're kind of trying to move the experience to like light speed to where it is, right? If it has any of these problems listed in this book that has been this book for how long, like since the beginning of the web, and you're company or something you're working on is broke like has this broken you are literally like moving at light speed for the people that you have to talk to and um one of the things i thought about listening to you guys was you can't do the math like they can't do the math themselves right so if it's a financial thing they'll be like oh, okay they can do the math in their head they get it so when we come in and we're like, guess what? <laughs> this is all this stuff and we're using all this jargon and we're like, we did all these user tests and blah, blah. They themselves probably have their own um, insecurity of like, I guess I just gotta like trust these guys that they know what they're talking about. Um, and who knows what type of lens or label they're putting on a UX team or, you know, a lot of the times anything I say you know, if I said, um, oh, yeah, I want an information architect, they're like, what is that? What do they do? Why do they, why would they cost X amount, you know? Um, and that's just like a long story. So the, it probably comes up every single time that a design team is presenting or completely switched everything around or is talking about affordances or whatever, you know, a button, just a button to them, um, is that they can't, they don't have a quick way of validating what we're saying. 
Mm -hmm. um, there isn't the amount of work and knowledge that we're getting. Because like even with um like the Nielsen Norman stuff, it is intangible like this book is, right? And a lot of stakeholders aren't reading books like this or it being exposed to information as this. So when I think about like <laughs> uh, Todd's example in the white space, oh my God, um, I use I had once a CMO that came in that came from Apple and just wanted to wipe all the color off of the website, like the entire website. And it's just like, it's a huge website. <laughs> um, things like that where they're gravitating or using just what they were exposed to or known. I'm like, who taught you this word white space? And do you understand what you're saying when you use it? Like, it's those type of things where it's probably super, um, like unrailing for them for us to come in and be like guess what we have to put all this effort in these changes and they just have to go with it they just have to trust us in some fashion sure. and y'all might have seen my eyes darting around i think that this falls in that vein because i was looking through the book because i was thinking what everyone was saying was got me thinking okay well, how is it that we do this how do we persuade how do we make the case because you know there are still some people that will see that five minute cursor going around and you know still it won't change their mind and i remember in the book um, there was that section about uh, demonstrating the ROI. And so I'm posting this in the, the chat. It's the cost justifying usability an update for the internet age by uh, Bias and Mayhew. And know nothing about the book other than that's what made me think of. Uh, it seems like that could be you know, a practical way of translating usability into um, the actual monetary. And so um, Tiffany, I was thinking about that when you were talking about we need an information architecture. This is why they cost this much. This is you know, justifying that case. So, um, yeah, I've never, I haven't checked that book out, but may, might check it out. Might be another book, cl book club book. Who knows? But that might be a good way to be able to, uh, you know, get some of those more practical aspects into it um, as well. I love that. What a great suggestion. I hadn't heard of that one yet before. Mm. First time. Well, it was, it was one of one of those that I actually didn't highlight. I usually highlight books that I want to go back into, but now this conversation has changed my mind thinking about, especially if it's kind of practical. Because um, I think that that's kind of a disconnect sometimes that we have. We like to be kind of in the more artistic, ethereal, it's good for people. Um, at least I know, speaking for myself, it's a bigger, bigger lift to translate that into the business sense and use kind of those business terms. So um, yeah, I'll probably be checking this out. Hopefully it's uh, useful for other folks as well. Yeah, anything that's ROI, um, when I first became a director is just like, it was so hard. And I listened to a few podcasts of people kind of talking about it. And I'm like, that's not saying anything. <laughs> like I need literally a formula yeah. um, to tell someone I need to hire someone that's going to cost $150,000. Like I need like something tangible. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what I am excited about is UX has done a really good job or, um, you know, web designers to at least figure out how to get the data points to influence why we're making the change that we have. Right. So, but very, like you said, someone could look at it and be like, that doesn't seem like a big deal. Like mm -hmm. one of the things that I noticed is, okay, so one person, you captured one person struggling. What is that impact? How many people, you know, so that would, that'll be the first question. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is really like, what's the cost benefit to the investment that we're making. And that, that part of the question has been really hard for me to find information on. Um, and at a scalable kind of conversation, right? Like anybody that says, I'm going to make a marketing plan. I'm going to buy into Google ads. This is the ROI that we expect. It's a 12% lift. Like I can't have that conversation from a design perspective and I need to, I think we all need to. Um, so anything that has anything to do with ROI, like I'm all about it because I know that's like the end of the conversation that we may not necessarily be get there. I, I've even heard some, um, you know, we have like our design stars out there and they'd be like, if they're asking you about ROI, that's not the place you want to be. Like we can't, I think that's part of the complacency side of it that I don't want us as a design industry to do anymore, right? Like if you don't get it, then I'm just not going to say anything. I'll make the change that you want to change. Like, no. Um, I wanted to be informative and be like, okay, this is how I think you should do it. It's a take it or leave it, but I'm still going to like advocate that or argue that case. The other piece is I can't just make changes and not know the, the impact, whether it's resources and costs and time. 
Um, every other team can do it. Like I think the design team needs to be able to do it too. And I think that we're, we're getting there. Um, but if I feel so strongly about the design efforts I want to put in, like usability, like a lot of that doesn't happen until the company thinks they're going to get sued. Right. And then it's like, okay, great. So I'm not going to do this. I want to bring in a usability team expert. They're going to cost X. And they're like, for them to do what? For them to then tell us that we have all these dev changes to that, that we have to make. So um, I think it's just a conversation that we need to really unpack more um, as designers. I think the more that we do remote work, the more that we have freelance and contract be like the only thing right now because no one can bring on a full design team that they fired during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to have to continually about, like make that calculation of, what do my wireframes cost? What are they going to give you? Um, I gave, and it really, really only works with teams that kind of have been exposed to UX before. Um, in this time, I was able to produce a UX audit, but I was talking to a CTO that understood that UX was meaningful and they didn't have a UX team there. Um, we, and then I had another person who was a CMO, so marketing side, and I was like, great, this audit is going to be this. And then his response was like, oh, I really need to think about what I think I'm going to get out of this. Mm. Right. And so I need to be able to have, tell him what that is um, and be able to have some type of formula of, I can assume that your user experience, you're getting X amount out of it, but you're losing like top of funnel. So anything about like Jason's example with new companies that come into that industry, right? So if we use <laughs> Facebook and MySpace, they're going to come in at a certain level of their experience. And that gap, the more and more you have all these new, you know, um, community companies come into the space, your gap gets bigger. And it's fine for people like Jason and Spotify where they're already vested, they can't leave. But they, you, if you don't fill the top of the funnel with new customers, because your experience is crappy and everybody knows it, then Pandora and everybody else is going to take that, right? And then eventually your customer base is going to die, which was what was happening with my old company. They were starting to die <laughs> because they're old, old customer base. Um, and you haven't filled it with the new customer they're base. And really I think that dying. that's that convert. Yeah, like physically, yeah. <laughs> they're a retired group. Wow. So <laughs> eventually. <laughs> um, and that was one of the big like learnings that in, in when I think about business overall that I didn't realize. You, the user experience moves at the speed of technology. If you don't keep up and you're not filling in the top of the funnel, then you're just that's the part of like the conversation that we always have, oh, you're not gonna exist, but it's like, why? Like, what is that conversation? Um, and that's where I really see it is that we, it isn't just like iterate to iterate, new companies are making that investment and the gap's getting bigger. And so you eventually you could be like, oh, well, I don't wanna go back to this experience because it was crappy. Someone else is doing it better and they're selling the same stuff. Yep. I like yeah, that absolutely. filling the top of the funnel mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the company that I was just at, they weren't filling the top of their funnel. They weren't keeping up with the technology side of things, which eventually I keep, I keep in contact with one person at that company still. They lost their number two uh, customer, mm. a very large customer. So that is the casualty of not, you know, keeping up with technology and not keeping that flow of new people coming in, like you said, mm -hmm. Tiffany, the, filling the mm -hmm. top of the funnel. I really like that. Yeah, it, it, I think it makes sense of where, like the dumpster fire, where you're like, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine for the people that are already committed but you're going to bank on them making sure that your company is going to keep going for the next 50 years. Like that doesn't even make any sense. Um, and I think that that's where that like comfort happens for stakeholders where they're like, what do you mean? We're selling. <laughs> so I wonder how as 
and maybe that's the definite really truly the definition of like a design innovation digital team is that it is part of our responsibility to remind everyone and be the experts of like this is where the trajectory is going like you need to keep up you know what happens if you guys don't invest in voice and we just haven't figured out how to be a part of the echoes of the world because everyone's just going to buy stuff by talking about it and not actually going to their computers. That's, I'm curious about retail in that regard. Or just not, what if you can't put people in a warehouse anymore and you haven't bought into the Kivas or whatever they're called, um, the little robots to pick up all your, all your fulfillment? I'd rather have, you know, that, that steady, I guess, climb to, you know, keeping up with everything and keeping new customers and stakeholders, real, I guess, realizing that you got to trust the people that are telling you these changes will benefit everybody. Um, because when <laughs> early on, you know, we, we were getting memos and I get a text message from a coworker and it's uh, just a gif of that street, wherever it was that was flooded in that, that dumpster just floating down the street. And I'm thinking, this is not good. This is not good at all. <laughs> Well, I think Tiffany had a, a great point that she had said about the, the trajectory of things. And that's one of the, always yeah. the th final thoughts I like thinking about with these is if this book was written in five or 10 years, what are the things that would be added? So, you know, just the conventions of phone were about starting to get on there. And, you know, I think that's virtual space next, that's voice. Even I think it's bigger screens going the opposite way than smaller screens. I'm using my TV so much now and would love to be able to interact with people and like to have like webcams on that. Um, you know, just what are the times, what are they gonna shift and whatnot. But, so that's just something I'd love to leave you with as far as the thought, we're at time and I actually myself need to run to another meeting, but um, y'all can feel free to stay on and, and keep chatting. But I just wanted to, to wrap up my time and my portion and thank everybody for being here and um, tell everyone to, to keep looking for, uh, for the next book club book um, coming down the line for voting and whatnot. I love the conversation, I think this was fantastic. We were able to really tie in a lot of the things that we've done over the course of the book club, a lot of the books. Mm -hmm. So thanks so much for being here. Keep thinking about those conventions of the future. And uh, we'll be chatting soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.